we are going to start now. Um, hi, I'm Ed Gates. I'm on the steering committee of PXR. I'm sitting on the floor of my room right now, so this feels really like informal, and yet here you are all in your colorful audience-ness. Um, welcome to day two of PXR. Welcome to presentation. Sorry, I'm replying to things as I am talking, which is super fun to do. Um, uh, <laughs> welcome to the Toaster Lab presentation. Um, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to start. And then Ian Garrett, who I believe is still to my left, and Andrew Zephry, who is still to my right, and Justine Garrett, who will join us to our Toaster Lab. Um, and we're super, super thrilled to have them um, both as partners on this uh, a crazy wild adventure of PXR. Um, and I, I sit on their advisory board um, for the Mixed Reality Performance Atelier, so uh, I know these folks well, and they've got lots of great ideas. Um, to little bits of housekeeping, um, there's going to be, um, Oh, no, we don't have that tool. Sorry, there's a new tool that you're going to be in, introduced to later on in the day. It's a hand raise function, but we don't have it for the toaster world. So we will just um, like physically raise our hands. We'll deal with Q&A when we get to that point. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the, the contributions of the Canadian Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund, which is making this, uh, this revolutionary symposium happen today. So. Welcome from wherever you are on this globe. Um, many of you are beaming in from many places, and uh, we're super, super thrilled to have you all here. So I'm going to turn it over to the Toaster Lab folks, and I will be here um, to help move you around. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Garrett. Uh, before I do too much introduction, because um, I, this is a weird thing to point out in virtual space, but apparently from our rehearsals uh, in, in tech that this room needs to get set up for something after us, which seems like very strange that we have an infinite amount of space that we need to clear out of space. But um, we sort of have a, um, a bit of a, a meta presentation uh, for the type of work that we're talking about, which is going to be around uh, different ways of starting to get involved with different types of XR technology. We want to have some conversation around that. And one of the ways that, that we should do that, because everybody here obviously is able to get into alt space, everybody in the alt space space uh, here with us is able to get into alt space, is actually start by going to another world together um, and talking from there. So um, if, you, uh, if you were able to participate in one of the earlier orientations, you'll be familiar with the teleportation mechanism. Um, I will uh, explain it as we go in a moment, and then we'll reintroduce, uh, reintroduce. There may or may not, we weren't sure how many people, because there's two sessions we're going on. Um, uh, there may be limits to the world. I hope that we can get everybody in. Um, uh, but no way to know without trying. All right, so here we go. So there should be a blue glowing orb right in front of me. And if you take your your hand, yep, and go ahead and click on that, I'm gonna see how many people we can get attached to it. Right now I've got 22, 23. I got 24. Are we, gonna leave, are we gonna leave a toaster person behind? Uh, <laughs> who are we leaving behind, team? You know how to get there. You just kind of, you, you come to me. Yeah, we know how to do it. All right, here we go. Looks like most people are tethered. We did. Everybody's manifesting themselves here. Welcome, everyone. This is our little sample toaster world uh, the, that we created. Uh, that we're going to get together. I'm going to do. I'm going to do an acknowledgement. Uh, so one of the interesting conversations that I I've been having uh, has been around like when you do land acknowledgements in digital space where you where do you acknowledge because you've got a combination of you've got a combination of wherever we are and a combination of wherever the servers are and wherever the data centers are etc 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 so um we uh toaster lab worked out of toronto or toronto 
um, and uh, sit on the lands, standing on the lands right now with our actual feet that we don't have in virtual space of the Anishabe, the Haudenosaunee, the huron Wendat, and the Métis. Um, the current treaty holders are the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We're very grateful to be here. Um, both of uh, uh, two of us from Toaster Lab, um, myself and Justine, are originally from uh, Los Angeles and Tongva land. So um, uh, a lot of thoughts go out to that right now, uh, to there right now. Um, the many of these servers that we've been interacting with um, over the course of this conference have also been on Ohlone land as well. So, okay, what we wanted to first do is share a few different types of ways of approaching uh, uh, mixed reality uh, uh, making. Um, sorry, Jacob, I had to mute you. I could hear you. I could see your mouth moving whenever I spoke. So we're all learning, we're all, we're all learning how things work. So we've set up this world First of all, this world was entirely built within alt space. So this is this is thing one. I ex invite you to. I've got the megaphone on. It's very hard to get lost in this space. Uh, we've got the basketball hoop, both uh, interactable times uh, towards the ocean. Uh, if you go and find the other corners opposite here, towards the giant donut, you'll find that there's some uh, fireworks. If you haven't had a chance to set those off yet, there's also an ice chest full of snowballs you're welcome to go you have to get up to them and you can use your hand to grab them all of these are things that uh, all those interactables are actually things that are um, available within the alt space uh, basics kit uh, they're also the ability for users to trade all sorts of different things that you can insert into your world uh, and everything that you see in here came from one of those there is no coding Except for, except for something that I needed to do to get the microphone engaged. But otherwise, insofar as exploring the world, there was no coding needed to be able to set this place up. All done from within my headset, uh, and, or there's a couple of things that needed to happen on the Altspace website. And so this is all through exploration and getting used to the, the hand controls of the world editor. So when, you, uh, when you're exploring around in Altspace, you can go to your home, uh, and you can start to add things to your home as well. You can, uh, there's the first place that you'll be able to engage with the world editor. But also if you open your alt space menu um, and go to, if you haven't already, go to settings uh, and the, the second item on your settings is to turn on the enable worlds beta. And it'll make sure that you can get to other people's built worlds as you find them, or you get uh, are able to build and create and customize your world as well. Uh, so you can do that either with your home world, which is the apartment that you defaultly get when you start uh, in alt space, or you can go. There's a menu there um, uh, when it opens up the worlds menu under my uh, my worlds, where you get a default one that's just on a blank slate. Uh, people have been sharing some of them in the in the discord as well um so as you build them it's really fun especially in between now and next week to be able to see like what you can create in there so you know if you, you take a look around and in addition to the interactables i just point out some stuff we started with a template that you could get if you start the world on the website you can uh, use a template this is like a, a city park template uh that's just like the fence um over towards uh over towards the ocean side, you'll notice that there's one panel of it that's a slightly different color because we, yep, everybody's looking in the right direction. Uh, it's because actually that one panel that's a slightly different color is something that we had to add to prevent people from falling off the side and falling to your doom. Um, your doom, which ends five seconds later and then you automatically respawn in the middle of the arch here, which came from the samurai uh, um, object pack. There's yeah, the fountain that we added uh, there's a couple of trash cans. You'll notice the flies and the butterflies flying around. Really excited about the giraffe. That's one of my favorite things that we added to it. You can scale things up to any size uh, that you that that you want. Um, uh, uh, so we've got this giant donut on one side, which I put the laundry in. It doesn't come that way. And you can put these items together, um, decide whether or not someone can walk into them or not through the collider, uh, etc. I I I spent too much time having fun with it. So just about everything, the atmospherics, the sound you hear in the background, all things are brought into it. The things that are custom brought into this for Toaster Lab were the skybox. I'm going to do quotation marks with my hands here by clicking uh, my trigger buttons. But uh, 
uh, alt space quotes of the skybox, which is so if anybody's used to doing a little bit of uh, video game development or has played video games, uh, you might notice that the off backgrounds don't change a lot. That's the cut down on processing power. It's a static image, and they try and make it so that they keep the polygon count, the rendering that needs to happen low. So they try and keep that to things that you're actually going to interact with us and the object we have here. So this is actually a 360 photo that we took um, on a project that we did down in uh, Tasmania, and it just seemed to work really well with setting up like a bright atmosphere here. We added cloud uh, cloud atmospherics and some actual floating clouds. Uh, as well as the um, the colossal ship, that's its name in the pack, in the space pack up at the top. And you push and pull things around. I'll actually see if I can add something without crashing our experience that I'll add in the panel. So if I wanted to add something else in, then go ahead and go into one of the kits and spawn something in front of me. Go ahead and add a purple flower. So now in my world builder kit, I've got a, I've got a, I, I'm actually not sure if you can see it until I lock it, but I've got a flower now that I've scaled in front of me and I can place this wherever I want through moving around. I can scale it by using my trigger and moving it away and towards me. And I'm going to plant it right here on top of this hill. And I'm going to lock that. Turn off my world, uh, world builder. And now we've got uh, a flower in the middle of it. So I, I don't have this turned on for everybody to use, but you're all, all able to use it um, in whatever world that you have. You can add flowers to your own uh, apartment and to the Vista loft that you're provided uh, by default, uh, or you can start uh, wherever. And it's uh, pretty much as easy as that. So that was like the first thing of why not bring somebody into a world and show them the different things that they can do. Um, our priorities at Toaster Lab are around creating accessible mixed reality experiences, and that takes on a number of different meanings, which um, one of the things that I've added, and this is one of the areas where you actually have to go uh, to the browser and log into your account, is I've added images, which instead of doing a standard PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to guide you around to the space to the various posters that we've put up that deal with some of the issues around uh, accessible VR uh, and AR experiences that we've uh, been uh, grappling with through a number of our different projects. We're working through a digital strategy fund with the Canada Council for the Arts uh, for a mixed reality performance atelier, where we come at it from a number of different angles in terms of um, different ways that the technologies will intersect with live performance. So sometimes that's actually when we could be in live theaters would be in live theaters and how that influences that or how that we bring that content into a mixed reality space, um, such as something like this. So I'm going to ask people to, uh, I'm going to walk through a couple of the questions that we uh, were that both we think about a lot and that we're very interested in. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump over to the giraffe over here um, and just call your attention to the two images up, uh, um, up above behind me here. You can see behind uh, the giraffe. Um, let's see. Uh, so if you take a look at that, what's, uh, what, one of the questions that we get asked a lot is what, uh, is, uh, what's in our kit, um, when we, uh, when we go out. So we do a lot of recorded immersive content. We'll do spherical video. We'll do uh, binaural and spatialized audio. And so we have a bit of a go kit that fits into an, uh, like a, a, a road case that goes into a, an overhead compartment in a plane, you know, back when we used to fly places, but something that was really small. Um, one of the things that's nice about working within uh, with recorded media for immersion is that, uh, especially within video, is that you sort of have to remain small insofar as the way that your crew works because you have to hide everything. There are ways in post to be able to ultimately cut things out or stitch things out, but because we're often dealing with 360 video, um, our preference is to try and make the content as easy to work with as possible, which that, that's actually one of the big challenges. I put, um, so on the left-hand side here, you'll see some of the, the cameras that we commonly work with, or at least types of cameras that we work with. I put all from one line here because it's a little bit easier and we, uh, we're, we're uh, pretty decent fans of the Insta360 line of products, um, though we also have used uh, the, um, 
have a couple of views cameras as well, V-U-Z-E, which I didn't put up here. Um, the Now, there are different ranges as which you can work here that, that, that will go from a couple hundred bucks to $5,000. Uh, if you, uh, and they are all have different levels of, of more intensity to work with. So for instance, the Insta360 One X, which is their handheld monoscopic 360 camera, it's, about, it's a little bit smaller than most uh, smart, uh, uh, smartphones uh, right now does uh, connect through Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to your smartphone, so you, not a, they don't have a lot of readout on them, so you usually need an app to be able to control them. Uh, but that's one that when we're doing workshops or um, have uh, uh, people who want to get started, it's something that we can slip in our pocket, It's and it gives you actually um, 5.7K resolution of the file that it creates. Now, one thing to remember or to think about when you're working with this content is that all the resolutions are a lie. Um, they're gonna tell you it's 5.7K or 4K or just HD. And that's usually the size of the final uh, final file. Uh, I know that's getting a little bit more in the weeds than I necessarily intended to get when we were talking about it. Um, but uh, what, what that means is that what you see, what you're seeing in your headset right now is only a limited field of view of everything that's happening around you. Um, when you're dealing with video and like the image that the skybox we see around us, it could be captured at one image, but it's the entire panorama that that resolution uh, appeals to. So that sort of 5.7K threshold has been sort of what allows you to see like kind of uh, uh, XGA resolution, or like if you think about the square flat panel monitors, from like the early 2000s, like an acceptable resolution for playing video, but not HD. That's sort of what you're gonna see in your headset per eye when you're working with the 5.7K uh, camera. Um, the other camera next to it, which costs about the same, but allows you to do some other stuff is the Insta360 Evo, uh, which is a convertible camera. You can either do 360 monoscopic with it or 180 uh, stereoscopic with it. And you still get the same 5.7K resolution, so you can get a really nice 180 image out of it. Um, it does mean that if you want a full 360 image, you have to sort of treat it to bring something into the background, um, whatever's behind the visible image. But we just used this for a project with uh, DLT Experience uh, for uh, a short film that was integrated into a project that they were doing for the, for the Biennale, where the area of focus uh, comes ahead of it. And then you can zoom all the way up to the professional camera uh, which is here the Insta360 um, Pro 2, which will do stereoscopic 8K. It's exciting to think about that much resolution. The thing to keep in mind when you're trying to deal with that level of resolution is actually being able to deal with 8K footage. Um, so uh, when you're dealing with the smaller cameras, it's actually something that oftentimes you can work with on your phone uh, and you can work with with most fairly recent, decently specced laptops. But think about like HD video is one thing, but now you're talking about getting up to essential, like just below 6K footage. Uh, the other, the, uh, and the other side that I'll, uh, that I'll point to over here is our audio. We have a couple of different audio input devices uh, that we use, uh, a couple different Zoom recorders. Um, one which uh, is, uh, exists and does, uh, the two at the top here, the H2N and the H3VR, both do ambisonic recording, which is really cool. Um, so that if you wanna match it up with 360 video, YouTube will be able to, if you put a, a, tab, a replace your audio tracks of that in Premiere or Final Cut, any, pretty much any of the non-linear video editors, um, it will spatialize when it gets uploaded to, um, to YouTube. Uh, the nice thing about the H3 VR, which um, uh, has been developed with the idea that people would use it for pairing with VR content, is that it also um, knows it's uh, what direction it's oriented as well. So you can put it upside down and it will correct that without you having to do anything with reorienting it because it can get a little tricky to do that. But oftentimes we're just dealing with binaural audio. Um, and we do that in a fairly budget level as well that's easy to travel with. So uh oftentimes we're just using these uh roland uh in-ear monitor microphones they're microphones and earphones at the same time you'll notice that they have two if you get up close to it you'll notice that it has two plugs on it and that's because one is so you can hear what's happening and put them in the ears and the other one is because each of the ears 
I think that you'll get a visual there. Each of the ears works to be able to, to give you a sense of uh, where, what you're recording a space. Now these are oriented in a specific direction. Um, uh, and you can tell that it becomes important uh, for us to have uh, uh, um, like the shape of the ear with it. So oftentimes we'll either actually just have a performer if they're, if they're not gonna be seen and we're recording it, use the in-ear monitor microphones, uh, or uh, we can also replace it with the uh, this uh, 3DO free space uh, binaural microphone there. And then one of the important things that we add into the mix there is having usually a recorder. We've started to do this with more remote recorders, but you can also get like a really inexpensive digital uh, voice memo recorder. But if you've got a good mic that can go into it, you can usually hide that on the performer as well. So this is like question one, what goes into our kit when we go out and we're trying to do an immersive recording experience? This is the, the like the basic for the equipment and we'll do sort of a mix and match around all these sort of different things as well. And other, I'm gonna move on to, I'm gonna ask people to come join me by the, the yes, a hand right here. That's what I wanted to uh, let's see. If a question, Van Burr. Hi, yeah, just wondering about yeah. the binaural micro earphones. Yeah. Um, what makes them binaural compared to a regular in-ear monitor? So they, uh, I mean, as a, as a set of headphones, they pretty much play as any other set of headphones. It's that the outside edge of them is a microphone. So what makes them binaural is that they have a microphone that essentially is going on the opposite side, on the outside of your ear. So what you're hearing in each ear separately and being able to locate things in the space because you're able to see where um, you're able to receive that audio information at different points, it's recording it in an identical way because each of the channels, the left, right channels, is actually in literally in your ear as well. So it's monitoring and functioning as an omnidirectional microphone on each ear? Yes. Cool. Thanks. No, no, my pleasure. So again, was that a question that you have a hand up? Yeah, I just, just about the headphone thing. So if you're wearing those binaural headphones, do you have to be careful how you turn your head around? Like you need to, like, if you're planting that on one of the performers, do they need to sort of stand like steady or does the image change every time they spin their head? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, as you reorient to yourself, it will reorient to, uh, the um, the experience to the space as well. And as that's as that's uh, happening, you sort of that's why we carry both with us as well. Because uh, yeah, okay. if we're looking at something where we want a stationary point where someone can turn their head around, versus we're trying to provide a more directed point of view, because there's some of a um, there's some of a, a dramaturgical need sometimes that even if we have it that somebody could look around and we've staged things all around the camera that we're still sort of orienting the audio in one direction, like we're biasing it towards one direction. So we'll oftentimes do a combination of two or three of these different ways of recording. We'll have the mono recording of the performer to enhance, uh, to pull them out over the, the ambient space and uh, the ambient noise of either the binaural or the ambisonic. And sometimes we'll do both the ambisonic to get like lots of room tone, but then the binaural to really space a biased spatialization. Um, and it, it just cool. becomes a bit of balancing that. Yeah. Cool. Um, Thanks. We have found that the, the most useful thing is actually to focus on the binaural um, because uh, to help with directing somebody's uh, distance, you sort of get the quadrants out of the, like your ability to locate sound in space is not so precise that um, if you're less than a hemisphere off, like less than 180 degrees off. Generally, right. there's a lot of tolerance for accepting that in the way that it comes together. Cool, thank you. Cool. All right, I'm gonna come over, I'm gonna go and jump to the other side of the space here over by the, uh, you'll find me over by the, uh, the slightly submerged in the land or the landlocked boat. We come over to some of our distribution questions over here. All right, it's here. Okay, good. Our jump is working. Um, so you can actually work your way through the boat too uh, there. Um, so the, uh, what I'll call attention to over here is that uh, Postal Lab work, work, uh, does a lot with geolocation. They're really interested in space. Um, if you want to start getting, uh, start working with space, there's a couple of apps that you can download right now. 
Uh, many of them are cross, uh, a few of them are cross-platform or browser-based. So it hasn't been updated in a while, but um, if, you, if you just want to get started, like locating things in places, you can use the intercaching system. You do not have to set up an account tied into geocaching, but it allows you to use a browser-based access into uh, your, your GPS. Um, there's also a couple of, a few different apps that allow you to create your own stories in sort of a platform distribution, uh, uh, such as Locosonic, Voice Map, and Echoes or echoes.xyz, which is sort of where they direct to, which will allow you to build various types of audio tours or spatialized uh, things or download what other people have created as well. In each of those, um, there are free and paid versions of it, depending on how you're going to use it, but there are good ways to get started. And I know that the Locosonic, uh, which allows you to create sort of like overlapping radiuses where audio will will plant are, are really useful. Um, in trying to make things uh, accessible, uh, we do a lot of stuff uh, where we're trying to use phones uh, and people devices that people already have. Uh, I have a thought that one day something that's going to happen in the not too distant future based off of where we see patents and things like that going is that a lot of these things are going to be integrated. A lot of the advancement in the headsets that we have, like the positional sensing, um, high resolution, dis like pixel dense displays, all of those different things are things that are um, useful for creating VR and VR headsets, but a lot of what spurred on that technical innovation also comes out of um, the smartphone boom. Uh, so it made a lot of those parts a lot less expensive to be able to access them. Uh, and also, though it's not as active right now with, with like the Google Daydream project, but there were a number of different, uh, a number of different, um, uh, a number of different um, ways to be able to access on your phone. So right now you can also upload any 360 content you have to YouTube and Vimeo, and you can play that either as a as a 360 experience that someone can move around uh, on their phone, or you can change it over to the binocular uh, cardboard view, which with a cardboard viewer, 10 to $15 from Google, you'd be able to uh, watch that 360 content the same as you would on a number of different like dedicated headsets as well. So really low barrier way, um, once you're able to create the content to distribute it is to work that way. And that sort of works with a number of the projects that we do at Toaster Lab, which I highlighted here. Um, we do a lot of stuff in browser. So we've got our Parkway Forest project up, up here in the upper left. You can go to parkway, uh, uh, parkway.toasterlab.com and actually open this. It uses all online um, mapping. Uh, it does uh, require moving into a player to do 360 content to move that into another player. Um, and so sometimes that's one of the trade-offs there. And when we've not wanted to do that, we've moved things into an app-based environment. So we did a project called Transmission a few years ago. And so we were still streaming the content, but the playing was built into the app itself. Uh, last summer in Prague around the Quadrennial, we worked on a project called Remember Me, uh, which uh, mainly was because people didn't necessarily have access to data plans while they were there. We, uh, uh, we and I mean Andrew, who's over there, uh, um, uh, built a, a packaging system to be able to download content. And right now, our, our biggest project that's just like just now sort of in a, in a software lens, just a couple of extra features that are still uh, pending uh, that will be out shortly is Trail Off, which is uh, a project um, in Philadelphia, which uses that packaging system, has a more abstract way of interacting with it and is meant to sort of like disappear. And these are all different levels of sort of like difficulty and and development that get into these various issues of how do you want to distribute this content? Will people have data? Um, will do you want to maintain the um, the the in-app experience, or are you willing to jump out into things like YouTube? We tend to jump out to YouTube because if someone's on an Android device, they tend to already it tends to be pre-installed because it's another Google product, um, or uh, there's a high level of adoption uh, on Apple as well. So other, other low barrier ways to start getting involved with making content for mixed reality, especially with video. Um, moving to some other examples, I'm just gonna come to the other side over here. Hello, Adrian. Um, uh, though uh, I don't know, like I feel sort of like weird, like someone from the alt space police is gonna come 
and uh, tell us to take this slide down. Another platform that you can try and use that works in browser cross-platform and in headset, but actually as a browser experience is Mozilla Hubs, uh, which is free to use, open source. Um, you can bring very similar things into that. It has different sort of world limitations, different sort of avatars in it. You can sign into it or not. Um, but it's another, if you if you take a look at the Mozilla Hubs platform, um, it is something that, uh, uh, like Altspace, will allow you to gather people together like this um, with, with its own quirks. Uh, but it's something that also works on mobile and works on, uh, it, because it's browser-based, will work across uh, Mac and PC as well uh, with its limitations. It doesn't have quite the extensive world builder here, but you can import things. Um, but it's one place where we've started to play with things and pull content together. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to move down the line here because I want to make sure we stay on time. Yep. Follow me as I give you a tour of our gallery of accessible uh, AR, uh, AR VR technologies. Um, we started doing some projects around uh, facial capture. One thing that you should know is that if you're like, had ever seen work done with like a Kinect or a depth camera, is that if you have a phone that was built, uh, a bought in essentially the last three years, you probably have that technology built into it. If your phone unlocks with your face, then you have a phone that can do some level of motion capture. Uh, and so there are two apps that I'll point to. Uh, one is called FaceCap and the other one's Live Face. Uh, 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 FaceCap is uh, uh, not tied to a specific platform, but you can, uh, with the paid version of it, which I think is like 70 or 80 bucks, uh, you can record and export and integrate that with Blender or Unity and create facial motion capture there. Um, if you want to work within the Real Illusion family of software, they have a whole suite of motion capture animation software, um, then you can use Live Face, which is free, and connects with their stuff. And all their stuff is on a 30-day trial. So we recently did a project where we were able to accomplish it all within the 30-day trial to create a full motion capture character for a stage show using uh, FaceCap. And um, if nothing else, you can get creeped out by it tracking your face um, and showing you either this generic gray uh, uh, floating head or give you the uh, the wireframe you can see if you get close there. And then the last topic that I wanted to bring in, in the time that we had today, just moving over here to my white butterflies by the other trash can as we're working through things, is questions of access. And all of these ask questions of what type of device that you want to use as well. And I want to highlight something that's a conversation that, that I've been having with a few different people. I and mean, we're talking about accessibility um, within uh, the VR space. And one of the things that I think is an example of uh, design bias um, and different levels of thinking about access and perhaps even to the extent that it's ableism, I don't know. Um, uh, but that if you look at the evolution of the Oculus, the popular Oculus headsets, the Oculus Go, which sort of was the first really viable standalone headset, but it didn't give you as much freedom of movement um, quite until we got to the Quest, had a fixed uh, IPD. Like the distance between your pupils will set up something that would be acceptable to most people. Um, but the Oculus Quest, they expanded that because you have a little bit of tolerance for it so that there's a slider that like right now I'm touching it, but it's underneath your left eye. And you can move back and forth to help you focus a bit based off of the the, 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 the individual distance between your, your eyes. Uh, so you're not getting things to double up. In bringing the, the cost down for the Quest 2 and, and changing its size, they actually limited it to just three specific sizes, basically assuming that that would be able to, uh, for people who could uh, to see between them, would be able to accommodate them. Like one would be comfortable enough. And you know, there is some understanding of that, um, that there are the idea of edge cases in there. But I think that it's an important thing to consider with all of these, even with the cardboard viewers, there are ones that allow you to have adjustable uh, IPD settings in between them uh, for not much more, but that thinking about as much as like now in this COVID time when we're not able to gather like in the flesh in carbon space and now we're in this alt space in this VR space together, which is great to see this this like number of people spatialized together, that there are also people be like even for simple things as the headset just isn't comfortable or isn't comfortable to see that there are issues of access that uh, that uh, look at that uh, look there. So 
everything from this question of the, the cost and how to start creating low cost mixed reality content to actually how someone's actually going to be able to use it with the devices that they have available um, are, are the types of questions and the types of things that hopefully they'll come away from this a bit um, with some ideas of how you can experiment and, and things like that. We've got a couple of minutes. Sorry to sort of rush us through there. I know that we're in a, in a, I know that we're in a, like compressed space, also trying to take care of everybody uh, so that you're not stuck with a headset on your face for eight hours a day. Um, that's the dystopian future we'd like to perhaps avoid. Um, maybe not. Maybe it's really, really a nice uh, uh, change. Um, but are there any questions? If you want to use that hand raise, because we don't have the moderator functions in this custom world, have used this hand raise. If you pull up your emojis uh, from your alt space menu and raise your hand, I'll come closer to you to make sure that you're on my mic too. Got a, I, I've got some floating hands. All right. Well, I know that was a lot of information on the, what I would actually in, uh, welcome you to do. So right now, if you're like, okay, that's great. I want to get back to the main space. You can, uh, I'll guide you back to that way as well. If you uh, head into your alt space menu, you can go back into your events and um, same as you may have uh, got there, be uh, there before to get back to um, uh, PXR Central to prepare and take a, maybe take a little break or hop out or head home and start playing with that world editor. You're also more than welcome to stay here and I will remain here as we wrap up. Yes, you got a question here, Duncan. Yeah, hey, 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 so I, I just wasn't clear. How do you integrate the stuff with live performance? Like I get that you're sort of making these virtual experiences, mm -hmm. I, but what sort of stuff have you done integrating this stuff with like theater kind of stuff? <laughs> So there's a couple of different ways that we've done that. Sometimes it's the back end technology. So like the facial motion capture that we've been looking at has been something that has helped us to drive like computer generated content that's been involved in like projection design. That was one of the last things that we did right before things went down is that we had a computer generated character that was performed and done through motion capture through that system. Um, in, so we're looking in, at in integration real time or in real uh, mostly recorded. Okay. Um, because the performer is also on stage, but with the thought that originally it would be real time, someone just off stage, um, uh, or in a, an adjacent space. And that's something that is, we've actually, well, I personally also before Toaster Lab was in its formal state was like something we're really interested in, in sort of like a remote motion capture puppeteering for projected characters or, um, like holographic projections, like at, um, uh, for like. Tupac at Coachella is the example that most people are familiar with. Right, right, right. And looking yeah. at those systems for integration for how you could continue to do that live um, and do that sort of animation live. Uh, with the, uh, so thinking about like the geolocation, a lot of that work actually relates to the fact that we are trying to allow someone to have an immersive experience of, a, uh, of an event that might be asynchronous with the event or might uh, be integrated with a series of events, some of which are synchronous or not. So when we did our project transmission in Edinburgh, about a third of the, the, the experiences were just audio only, uh, immersive audio, about a third of them were video, and a third of them were live, both staged and site specific. And so the idea of integrating the geolocation was to bring you to an individual place to indicate that there's, you know, a reason to be here and then trying uh, to create a bit of the re reality bridge, either through bringing the characters that you see throughout the experience. Sometimes you see them live and in person, um, though, perhaps uh, at a distance at specific times. Sometimes you're only hearing them. Sometimes you're only uh, seeing them and trying to blend all of those experiences together. So you're sort of collapsing that uh that those those experiences that that sort of confuse the time and space element to it cool. and then okay. something like yeah yeah and and then i just also offer that something like alt space here or um if you get a chance to talk to beth cates about her experience with pandora x and other other projects that she worked on and some of the stuff that we've been seeing happening in mozilla hubs about taking people like it gathering like this and bringing the performance into the vr space as well and so we're looking for efficient ways of doing that um, 
and 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 then the last one I'll mention is is some of the films that we've been creating for VR spaces also used as like a transition space within live performance. So we've done a couple of live shows where there's a scene where you are brought into a space where there is a dramaturgical imperative to put on a headset. And it's about transporting that person to and from those spaces as well. So all sorts of different ways that we've been trying to experiment with how we might be able to do that. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. We should set up a space at, at, at Glendon so we can get it back to the keel. Too. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do it, man. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I, I sort of uh, honed in there so I could make sure that I, I heard. We've got one minute left for the time in here. So I'll thank you all for joining here. We're going to create a link so you can come into this space. Oh, yep, there's a question here. I'll, I'll finish saying this, and then people can jump away or, or stay here as necessary. But don't worry. I'll get to the question in just one sec. Is that... Um, we, uh, you're welcome to come here anytime. We'll put a link in the Discord so you can pull it up 2D or 3D. If you go into your menu and you did turn on the world's beta, you can um, uh, and you can see where you are. Um, you should be able to favorite this world. But we'll also put instructions for how to do that in the Discord. So you can come back here, um, do whatever you want to it and uh, add things to your own world as well. Uh, Jason, you had a question. Yeah, could you, uh, I, I've, I'm, I'm coming in 2D right now. Uh, my Go didn't yeah. handle it. <laughs> uh, but the, <laughs> the uh, face, the live cap, so face cap and live face, could you yeah. share the links to those apps in the Discord as well? Because I'm trying yeah, to have trouble Googling them. Yes, I will, I will, for all the things that got mentioned in here, I'll go ahead and put together a little bit of a resource list. And drop that into the Discord uh, so that um, you can come in here and, and take a look at it uh, and and see the gallery of potential things and then have a reference for where, uh, where it is as well. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Well, thank you. Explore. Um, feel free to set off some fireworks. You can't damage anything. Um, and we'll see you a bit later. Thank you all. Bye. Hey. Ha 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 ha!